Okay, so let me start with my actual presentation. <clears throat> it is, uh, you know, it's going way back in time, but it will uh, eventually also come to the present. Uh, hartree fock theory and its generalizations. So my talk is divided into three parts. Uh, first, I will discuss the traditional hartree fock theory of atoms and molecules. Then I will come to generalizations of hartree fock theory. This will be more an abstract mathematical part in a way. And the third part is about restrictions, restricted hartree fock theory, and broken symmetries. Okay, so let's start with um, the traditional hartree fock theory. And um, to set the stage, I first want to quickly go through uh, the basic objects of quantum mechanics. We need a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian. So here is the Hilbert space. We're treating a many-body or n-body theory. We need a one-electron Hilbert space. That's going to be the space of square integral functions of space and spin, denoted by little h. Then the n electron Hilbert space is the n fold antisymmetric tensor product, so the subspace of the n fold tensor product containing the antisymmetric vectors. It is the linear span of the Slater determinants. As you can see here, I'm not so sure about the laser pointer, it's probably not so well visible. Anyway. So uh, it's the wedge product of F1 through Fn, suitably normalized for orthonormal orbitals Fi. And then uh, having defined the n electron Hilbert spaces, we can uh, write them conveniently in an orthogonal sum, uh, and we call this the Fox space F, fermion Fox space. And if we use creation, the usual creation and annihilation operators, uh, those that are obeying the canonical anti-commutation relations, then uh, we can write a Slater determinant as a product of n creation operators acting on the vacuum vector. And so uh, the n particle Hilbert space is then the span of products of n creation operators acting on the vacuum, and the Fox space is the linear span of vectors of, oh, thank you very much, Lynn, uh, of uh, vectors of arbitrary products of creation operators. So let's see, ah, this works great. So now uh, the Hamiltonian. Uh, I'm first discussing atoms and molecules, so, uh, but in general, the Hamiltonian that I think of and I can treat is a sum of a one-body and uh, operator plus um, a pair interaction, usually a pair potential, V. And um, here you see the n-particle Hamiltonian. The one-particle Hamiltonian acting on the nth variable is the kinetic energy and then the attraction by k nuclei of charge zk at positions rk. So it's a Born-Oppenheim approximation, if you like, or clamp nuclei approximation. And then uh, the interaction potential v of x comma i is the Coulomb interaction, repulsive Coulomb potential. Note that I write a comma here. I do not necessarily assume that the potential is a function of one position minus the other. Then uh, we can write everything in a second quantization using the creation and annihilation operators. And here's the result. We have the Hamiltonian with uh, one, the second quantization of the one particle operator and uh, the interaction, the pair interaction uh, uh, and its second quantization, all denoted in blackboard bold letters. Here we use uh, the creation operators for a, a fixed uh, orthonormal basis. We need uh, this basis to consist of uh, sufficiently regular functions, for example, eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillators. These are Schwartz test functions, and they would be fine here. 
to write this down. Of course, the definition does not depend on the choice of the basis. Then <coughs> the object that we are ultimately interested in is the ground state energy, the lowest spectral value the Hamiltonian uh, has, or the lowest energy expectation value. So I define it in terms of the variation of principle, the lowest uh, expectation value with uh, n particle wave functions, normalized n particle wave functions. So that's the ground state energy for n electrons. And uh, if we want to look at the total ground state energy, so this is um, the, um, the, the minimum, so to say, taking, taken over all particle numbers, but then subtracting a, a, a chemical potential times the number operator to give it stability. So um, the total ground state energy is, as you can see, a kind of a Legendre transform of the ground state energy for n particles. And then here we have the variation over all vectors in Fox space, which are normalized. And uh, h mu is the Hamiltonian minus mu times the number operator. So the Subtraction of mu times the number operator is, uh, for most models that we are interested in, a necessity to uh, stabilize the model. So, uh, so to prevent uh, this infimum here, the total ground state energy, to go off to minus infinity. And in the context of Coulomb systems that I'm presently discussing, um, this uh, statement is stability of matter. And stability of matter means that uh, the total ground state energy for a sufficiently small chemical potential mu plus the repulsion of the nuclei is bounded below by mu times the number of nuclei. And one can rearrange this inequality and then it says that the total energy of the system is bounded below by a constant times n, the number of electrons, plus k, the number of nuclei. So that's stability of matter, and that was first proved by Dyson and Lennart in 1967. And then Lee and Turing gave an improved proof, so to say, in 75. Um, now we come to the Hartree-Fock theory. The Hartree-Fock energy is an approximation to the ground state energy, and it consists, it is defined by um, restricting the variation of the wave functions, the n particle antisymmetric wave functions, to Slater determinants. So it is the infimum of this energy functional depending on. F, F is a collection of orbitals, F1 to Fn, which are orthonormal. And then we have a Slater determinant phi sub F, and we take the expectation value of this, the Hamiltonian, and we get uh, a, a quite um, simple expression for the energy expectation value of this state. It can be explicitly computed in terms of the orbitals Fk. Um, this is a functional actually, uh, well here I wrote of f, but one can actually write it as a functional of uh, little gamma sub f, which is the one particle density matrix, which will play an important role later. So if we uh, use the one particle density matrix, little gamma, and the corresponding one particle density rho, then the energy functional can be written, um, the Hartree-Fock energy functional, as the one body part of it. So it's the trace of the one particle operator times gamma, plus a direct interaction term, which corresponds, uh, as we see down here, to the classical electrostatic energy for Coulomb systems, and then minus an exchange term, which uh, does not occur for classical systems. So uh, for our 
model that uh, we are discussing for Coulomb systems with a specific choice of the one particle operator and the pair potential, the Hartree-Fock energy can be written as a sum of four terms. There is the kinetic energy, T. There is the attraction by the nuclei. This is a, this, it needs only the one particle density. Then there is the electrostatic energy, one half times D of rho. And finally, there is the exchange term that I mentioned before. So, so I repeat, uh, so to say, this um, uh, decomposition of the Hartree-Fock functional into uh, these four th terms because I want to give you an idea of what orders of magnitude these terms are in the context of large Coulomb systems. And large here means um, large nuclear charge. Okay, so let's see what <coughs> this is more specifically. So large uh, Coulomb systems have been studied uh, um, first, I would say, by Lieb and Simon in the late 70s, and then uh, this was followed by improvements on the energy asymptotics by Hughes and Siedentop and Weikart, who worked out the, I mean, Lieb and Simon um, proved that the leading order of the Hartree-Fock energy or the ground state energy of the system is given for, for neutral systems given by the Thomas Fermi energy. Then Hughes and Siedentop and Weikart contributed the Scott corrections, Scott correction for atoms, and Ivry and Siegel um, uh, proved this for molecules. And then um, uh, Pfeffermann and Seiko worked out the next correction, the Dirac-Schwinger correction, which is actually um, was already proposed by Schwinger in the early 80s. Um, and they proved that this is, uh, this is correct and gives the right correction to the order z to the 5 thirds. So you see that it comes in decreasing powers of uh, z to the 1 third. And, uh, and then there is an error term, which is uh, unknown up until today. I mean, uh, how, how, how large it is, what the next order really is, and so forth. So, uh, I also listed here Solovey and Spitzer who related this to relativistic theories, but let me uh, not go into this. So, uh, this asymptotics was proved and um, we can attribute now uh, to the four terms from the previous slide uh, the order of magnitude. So if we have an approx, if we have a minimizer of the Hartree-Fock uh, energy functional or an approximate minimizer, so we don't need the existence of a minimizer, we just need a, an, a Slater determinant that is close enough in energy to the Hartree-Fock energy, then um, the terms, the kinetic energy, the attraction by the nuclei, and the electrostatic repulsion will all be of order z to the th seven thirds, which is also the order uh, uh, of the Thomas Fermi energy. So it's the leading order in energy. So these three terms are of leading order. And the exchange term, however, is smaller, as we can see here. It's of order z to the five thirds. So the exchange term goes into this um, third term in, the, in this uh, kind of series here, asymptotic series. And the exchange term uh, is, uh, also this is remarkable, is only 9 eleventh of uh, this correction. And 2 eleventh of, this, of uh, the third term in this series two eleventh of this are contributed from the one particle term, from the semi-classical analysis or semi-classical asymptotics more precisely of the one particle term. It's very complicated, mathematically very complicated to squeeze this out. 
Anyway, so uh, we see the, the exchange term is the smallest, and um, yet one can see that the difference between the Hartree-Fock energy and the ground state energy is even smaller. So, so what this last statement here shows is that the Hartree-Fock approximation is accurate in the large Z limit as an approximation for the ground state energy, uh, including all the terms that contribute to the Hartree-Fock energy. Okay, so let me go on. If uh, the particle number is less than Z plus one, so it could be Z, for example, then um, there exists a minimizer, and this uh, Hartree-Fock minimizer fulfills the self-consistent equations that everybody knows here, of course. But the, the mathematical problem of proving that there is a, a, exists a minimizer is non-trivial. I mean, it's not understood that on a stationary point, the minimum is attained as a stationary point. And uh, in fact, as I uh, indicate here, if we consider an atom, then the ionization conjecture holds true, as was proved by Solovay. Uh, namely, if the, part, if the electron number exceeds the uh, nuclear charge of the atom plus a universal constant, which is not determined, but is, I mean, is a number like 10 or so, then uh, there is no minimizer. So more than Z plus C sol electrons do not bind in an atom, at least not in Hartree-Fock theory. And that's a result of Solovay. Actually, the conjecture uh, is, I mean, this is, so to say, one part of the conjecture, uh, A, it is proved in Hartree-Fock theory, and B, it is proved only for atoms. One would like to prove it for molecules, I mean, for Coulomb systems in general. Ultimately, one would like to prove it for the full uh, quantum mechanical system, that there is no ground state uh, of the n particle system, there exists no ground state if n is larger than the total nuclear charge plus a constant. It's, that's not observed, at least in nature. And, um, and in fact, it goes even further. Some believe that uh, the, the constant here, the Solovay constant, if you want, is, is one or two. But let me not speculate about this. So this is a, an important open problem and very difficult, a very difficult one. Then uh, what is known about um, the Hartree-Fock theory for Coulomb systems and also in general is that there is uh, no unfilled shell theorem. So if we look at the eigenvalues of the effective operator that enters the self-consistent equation, then um, the nth energy level, so here I count multiplicities, uh, the nth uh, energy level is strictly smaller than the, than the n plus first energy level. So, um, so in, in perhaps in language of uh, you know, quantum chemistry, one would say the HOMO is always strictly smaller than the LUMO eigenvalue. Then, um, closely related to Hartree-Fock theory is the cohen sham approximation. Uh, one could uh, get this from replacing the exchange term in the Hartree-Fock functional by linear density approximations linear density approximation or refinement of that, like the generalized gradient approximation. I'm not going into this, but I would like to point out that there is a nice um, uh, 
overview of uh, and derivation of these things in work of Anamantaran and Concess. Then also uh, there is some, there are some things known about excited states. So these are uh, in Hartree Fock theory defined as stationary points of the functional other than uh, the minimizer and um, uh, this has been proved in fact that there are infinitely many in, in an increasingly uh, uh, more general um, a series of results uh, ending with uh, Levine in 2018. Then uh, also, uh, I also attributed the, to Hartree Fock theory there, one might ask for uh, the inclusion of uh, relativity. What is the relativistic analog of Hartree Fock theory? Well, the uh, the relativistic analog of the Hartree Fock equation or equations are uh, the Dirac Dirac Fock equations. And these uh, have been studies, as you can see, by uh, many people um, that uh, I list here. I don't read uh, the, the list uh, to you. Uh, let me instead point out that there are uh, two things are fundamentally different to the hartree fock theory of Coulomb systems that I discussed before. Let me just point out these two differences. The first a mathematical difference is that we cannot uh, use a minimization procedure, at least not in the, in the way we defined hartree fock theory before, because the Dirac operator is not bounded from below. And so the energy functional is not bounded below. So one needs to somehow, one way or other, uh, treat the negative energy electrons as positrons and um, get uh, uh, this way a functional that is bounded below or treat the solution of the equations as a stationary point of a certain functional. So that's... So either way, it's not direct, uh, it's not direct the hartree fock method that can be applied here. And if we um, use uh, positrons to, uh, so to say, normal order the negative energy electrons and then renormalize the energy functional, we uh, in the end obtained the Bogolyubov Dirac Fock model, BDF model, and that has also been uh, analyzed in a series of papers listed below. So, besides this um, unboundedness below problem, there is another problem uh, with the relativistic, um, uh, with these relativistic models, namely the Kinetic energy operator for relativistic models is typically for large momenta like P and not like P squared, where P is the momentum. And this yields a much weaker uncertainty principle than the P squared we are used to from non-relativistic theories. And this, this causes instabilities if the nuclear charge is too large. In fact, um, if in, in the usual units, if it's beyond 87, then problems start to set in. So this has also been analyzed uh, to some extent in <coughs> various works. And let me <coughs> point out and um, direct you to this overview uh, article that I list here below <coughs> of uh, Esteban, Levine, and Serre. And <coughs> as you can see, um, Esteban is Maria, who's here, the chairwoman uh, of the session. She's the world expert on this matter, so you should ask her uh, with further questions on this. Okay, so <coughs> maybe uh, I skip this. Well, no, I don't skip this here first. I come to the second part uh, of my uh, talk, which is about um, generalizations of uh, the original Hartree-Fock approximation. 
So the first of these um, generalizations that I discuss is Leap's variation of principle. Uh, so first, let me uh, pass from wave functions to density matrices. We will see that uh, this is convenient. Uh, we will see later that this is convenient. So uh, we can write the total ground state energy um, uh, as a trace of a, a density matrix applied to the Hamiltonian, where the density matrix is just the projection onto the wave function. So this is just the same definition as I gave before. But then one sees that uh, one actually can take convex combinations of these pure density matrices without changing uh, the ground, the uh, infimum of uh, these traces. And so we get to the ground state energy as the infimum of a, of a density functional E mu uh, that depends on the reduced one particle and reduced two particle density matrices corresponding to a density matrix rho. So dm is the set of density matrices. And here uh, are the definitions of these objects. Uh, the density matrices are the um, trace class operators, so uh, the convex combinations of these rank one projections. Uh, Self-adjoint and positive, so their eigenvalues are between uh, zero and one, and the trace is, is equal to one for normalization reason. And then I also uh, demand that rho is uh, even, the density matrix is even, um, so it never maps it never increases when it maps an n particle space when n is even into an odd number particle space, and vice versa. This is a physically very reasonable requirement because all observables that we uh, study are even too. So here are the definitions of the reduced one particle and reduced two particle density matrices, gamma one rho and gamma two rho. So they're just defined as traces of the density matrix with the creation and annihilation operators. And if we insert these definitions, then the energy uh, can be written in this form. It's not, not a big deal. So, <clears throat> Similarly, we can uh, rewrite the n particle uh, ground state energy as a, with the same functional, but then requiring that the density matrix we consider is an n particle density matrix. So it commutes with a number operator, and in fact, it's equal to n the particle number. This is a number times rho. So what we need to remember for uh, what comes later is that the one particle de reduced density matrix is itself is an, is an operator with eigenvalues between zero and one, and its trace is equal to the number expecta the expectation value of the number operator, number expectation value. So let's uh, briefly compute what um, we get if we insert a special density matrix, a Slater determinant. If we have a Slater determinant um, phi sub g, and we look at the density matrix, the pure state, the rank one density matrix that projects onto the Slater determinant, then the one particle density matrix is the rank n orthogonal projection onto the orbitals gn, and the two particle density matrix is actually two times the projection onto the anti-symmetric tensor products of the gm and gn. So the two particle density matrix can be written in terms of the one particle density matrix where x is the exchange operator. 
Okay, so if we, um, so in other words, we can rewrite the Hartree-Fock energy of n particles to be the minimal value of the Hartree-Fock functional for these projections. I mean, these come from Slater determinants. We have projections, uh, orthogonal projections of rank n. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm, so to say, repeating the definition here of the Hartree-Fock energy in this line. I just rephrase it in terms of gamma instead of Slater determinants to point out what uh, the improvement of LEAP, the LEAP's variational principle, uh, is. So LEAP proved that you get the same energy if you take the same functional but relax the conditions on gamma. So the difference between this line and that line here is that in the, in the bottom line, gamma is not required to be a projection, but just having eigenvalues between 0 and 1. And uh, uh, so one could also say, uh, if, if we had started with uh, this def as a definition of the Hartree-Fock energy, we would uh, conclude that the infimum of this large set of one particle density matrices is taken on projections, perhaps. Well, there was one interpretation. Now, uh, this, um, this is an important um, observation of LEAP because uh, when we want to do variational analysis, mathematical variational analysis, we like to use convex sets over which we vary. And the set of rank n projections is not convex, but the set down here is convex. So we can take convex combinations and, um, you know, apply arguments of, uh, to, to, to get the minimizer of this functional. So then, <clears throat> the next thing I would like to introduce are generalized reduced density matrices. So these are, um, remember the, the one particle density matrix was uh, defined by the trace of the density matrix times a creation operator times an annihilation operator. And one can, however, <coughs> replace this or enlarge this to uh, put here a product of a sums of creation and annihilation operators. And that defines, uh, so to say, a, a matrix, a two by two matrix, as you can see down here, of uh, operators that are of the type of the little gammas. So these generalized one particle reduced density matrices are now denoted by capital gamma. And if you work out the four matrix elements, then you see that the diagonal elements are again given by uh, the one particle density matrix little gamma, but the off diagonal elements involve the pairing operator. So these are the expectation value of two, uh, a product of two annihilation operators or two creation operators. So any such operator uh, gamma, which is of this matrix form and uh, fulfills an, uh, an anti-symmetry requirement, alpha, uh, the adjoint of alpha is minus, uh, j is a conjugation, say, minus the conjugation of alpha. <clears throat> so um, this is an anti-symmetry requirement on, of, on the pairing operator, which is natural from just anti-commuting the C's here. Um, so if, if uh, this is fulfilled, then we call uh, the, an operator gamma uh, generalized one particle density matrix. So <clears throat> in particular, any of these up here that come from a row are such one particle gen generalized one particle density matrices. 
So that may be a bit uh, confusing uh, terminology, but let me just um, say that I use capital letters when it is the object that comes from the um, density matrix rho in Fox space, and the small letters are used for the objects that have no reference to any state. Okay, let me um, speed up a little. I introduce here quasi-free states. Quasi-free states are those states that um, whose expectation value of an even number of creation or annihilation operators can be written as a sum of pair, um, um, pair expectation values, as you see in the top line. And with this, um, if we have a quasi-free state, we can define the, uh, let me jump over this here. If we have a quasi-free state, then we can define the <coughs> Bogolyubov hartree fock energy, the BHF energy. So this is then defined to be the... Can I ask a question? Yes. Why quasi-free? So could you explain the difference between the quasi-free state and the free state? Uh, It is a free state. I mean, it was. Well, of so just a wonder what the quasi. Yeah, what the quasi uh, here is. Uh, I don't know really. I the think under the terminology, but maybe. But the underlying um, orbitals, so to speak, are not quite orthogonal, right? They have a complex inner product. They're real orthogonal, but not complex orthogonal, right? That's kind of the whole point of what you're doing, right? Uh, no, they are orthogonal. I mean, is um, no, no. It's... I thought that's what happens. That you have this ortho. The, the the imaginary part of the inner product is no longer zero. No, this is. I don't think this is the reason. Um, I mean, there is. A li well, maybe this is. This goes a bit into into detail, but. Uh, <coughs> I mean, these, these guys here, these sums can be interpreted as generalized creation and annihilation operators. And their commutation relation, I try to avoid this because it's a sort of heavy notation then. But if you introduce those, then uh, the, uh, you can re-express the canonical anti-commutation relation and it's not of the form you're used to with uh, that um, the anti-commutator of CK and CL is delta KL. Mm? But it's something, so to say, more complicated. It's if you take F and G, then the commutator, I think, is the real part of the dot product of F and G, which kind of allows this non-trivial imaginary part. Um, yes. <laughs> Maybe we go into this later. I mean, the... Uh, per, uh, let me just say that uh, this J here, this anti-unitary involution, is trying to make up for these problems with imaginary parts. But okay, let's let me skip this and uh, go to the to the Bogolyubov um, Artrefog energy. So, <clears throat> so this is uh, the infimum of the all expectation values of quasi-free density matrices. And um, then, um, this is on the uh, thing I have skipped, then one can see all quasi-free density matrices have a, I mean, are in one-to-one -one correspondence, their they one particle density matrix reduced density matrix are in one-to-one -one correspondence to all one-particle density matrices. So one can again um, forget about the n-particle context and just look at the infimum of an energy functional E BHF written down here, uh, which depends only on um, one-particle quantities, little gamma and little alpha. So the, <clears throat> the capital gamma that enters here uh, depends on uh, little gamma and alpha in this form, as I had, had indicated before. 
And if we have a Slater determinant, then uh, this is in particular a quasi-free state. I mean, the projection on the Slater determinant is a quasi-free state too. So if we vary over all quasi-free states up here, then we vary over more than the Slater determinants. So the infimum here is lower than the Hartree-Fock energy, potentially. So we get a chain of inequalities. The ground state energy is always bound in up, a lower bound for the Bogolyubov hartree fock energy, but it is in between uh, the ground state energy and the hartree fock energy. So potentially the Bogolyubov hartree fock energy is an improvement on the hartree fock energy. And uh, this, <coughs> is, um, this can be seen Sometimes, let me just skip the first point and only comment on the last two. If the potential, pair potential, is repulsive, so it's non-negative, the function V of x, y is non-negative, then the exchange contribution is always non-negative. And so, um, if we go back, and see that in the energy expression here, exchange uh, the, the pair operator enters uh, with a positive sign, so leaving it out decreases the energy. So therefore, the best we can do is to not to include the pairing if the potential is attractive. So we get this consequence for repulsive potentials. But if the potential has an attractive part, so if the potential is negative in, in, a, in a, some region of space, then uh, the pairing uh, in a minimizer, gamma BHF, may possibly non-vanishing. It depends on the model what actually happens. Okay, so... Um, this, uh, with this, I would like to come to <coughs> symmetries. That's a good point to come to symmetries. Yeah. So uh, first, I thought a little in the past weeks about how to define what a symmetry is in the context of Hartree-Fock theory. And here is my answer. So we, uh, we consider a family S. S of uh, unitary operators on Fox space. And we call this family, so these are, this is a set of operators, and uh, we call this family a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. If uh, for any unitary in this family, the Hamiltonian commutes with uh, this. So I do, for example, I do not take the generators, infinitesimal generators of symmetries here, because I want to uh, have a definition that works also for discrete symmetries. Okay, so that's it. Now, I define the restricted uh, bogolyubov hartree fock energy of S with a symmetry by, to be um, the infimum over all quasi-free density matrices that are invariant under all symmetries, under all unitaries in the symmetry in the symmetry set S. So that's natural. And if the total, I mean, if we, if we relax this constraint of invariance under the symmetry and get a lower energy, then the symmetry is broken. That's, that's a definition, it's a natural definition. So with this, I want to work through s several examples. But before, let me point out that if we look at the restricted theory, I mean, this is what uh, most often is, say, in atomic physics, for example, is taken for granted that you take an, uh, a basis uh, with uh, spherical harmonics and so forth uh, for the wave functions. Um, if this, um, if we impose such a symmetry, then there is no guarantee that the no-field shell theorem holds. So the gap between the nth and the n plus first eigenvalue may close. 
Okay, so now uh, let me discuss various symmetries and cases when it occurs or not. We have already seen that the particle number symmetry, so, I can, so this is the, this is the, these are the symmetries that are generated by uh, exponentiating the number operator, uh, gives um, no broken symmetry if the interaction is repulsive. That is what I had just uh, stated before, just in different terms, set in different terms. And uh, if, however, uh, the potential is attractive, then the particle number symmetry may be broken. Not, it, it, it doesn't mean it always is, it may be. And this, uh, in this case, one would uh, call this a BC, one, this would lead to a BCS theory. We'll come to this in a second. Now, um, let me just go through a few examples. Um, one is, uh, as I said, from atomic physics. That's maybe the most <coughs> intuitively clear um, example. If we take, uh, say, a lithium atom uh, with uh, three electrons, then the rotation symmetry is broken because the third electron, so to say, doesn't know where it should bind to the atom. But um, if we take uh, filled angular momentum shells up to, let's say, capital L, and then we drive up the nuclear charge, so it's a highly positively ionized atom, then one uh, Griezmann and Hansch have proved that uh, then the rotation symmetry is not broken. We get a spherically symmetric atom. But, I mean, it's, it's a bit um, a limiting situation. It's not very realistic. So that's about rotations, and I think this is what is known about rotations. Now, uh, translation and variance. Here we have to make sure that we do not enter um, operator algebras and these things. So we just put it on a torus. So we take a box with periodic boundary conditions, lambda. And then um, the, uh, <coughs> the group of symmetries is just the translations. And we have no external potential, so the one particle operator is just the minus Laplacian, say. And then we have the Fermi gas. And so we define the energy per volume without restriction and with translation symmetry in the bogoliubov hartree fock scheme. And then already in the 60s, Overhauser observed that the bogoliubov hartree fock energy in general is smaller than uh, the translation invariant uh, energy per particle. So this may be seen as a signature of a Wigner crystal or something. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, then there was a remarkable result a few years ago by Gontier, Heinzel, and Levine, who showed that uh, maybe, uh, I mean, we know the difference is positive between the energy per particle with translation invariance and without, but it is never uh, really big. Namely, it's exponentially small in the coupling constant. So it will never appear in any power series expansion in the, in the coupling constant. So uh, then, um, if we require translation and spin invariance on the torus, we get to the BCS model. This I do not want to discuss, but let me just close by <coughs> discussing a few things about the Hubbard model. So if we uh, take the Hubbard model, then um, in the usual setting, I wrote it down here, in the usual setting, then uh, this Hamiltonian has uh, uh, various symmetries. There is a particle number symmetry, there is a translation symmetry, and there is a global rotations of all spins. So we have a global SU2 symmetry. And uh, I want to look at the repulsive case, so the coupling constant G. I don't want to call it U because we have unitaries around here. So the coupling constant G is, is uh, uh, positive and the potential is repulsive. And therefore, as we have already seen, the particle number is not broken. 
So what about other uh, symmetries? Um, so we can first look at the restricted theory where we require that all symmetries are preserved. And then we get a, par a, a paramagnetic energy. And this, is, um, <clears throat> this can be seen to be the energy for some situations for small coupling and filling away from half filling. And uh, in contrast, if we go to very low filling, sufficiently low filling, and drive up the, co the um, coupling constant to make it sufficiently large, then um, the ferromagnet is the Bogoljubov Hartree Fock ground state. I mean, it's not exactly, but. Um, let me not go into detail. So it's a ferromagnetic ground state, and we know that then <coughs> the, Bogol, the unrestricted bogoljubov hartree fock energy is, um, I mean, it's probably equal to the ferromagnetic, but certainly less than the paramagnetic energy. And finally, uh, at half filling, there is a special situation when all this, uh, when both the translation and the spin symmetry is broken. Namely, in this case, we get a staggered configuration in the minimizer, a staggered conf configuration of the spins. So from one side to the other, the spin is flipping its orientation, but we can freely choose uh, its direction in space, and, <clears throat> and this is the BHF minimizer in this case. Yeah, so uh, this is the end of my talk. I thank you for your attention.